All right, as you might have imagined, we're still in the book of Romans this morning. I may be saying this for the next decade or two. I like to move it along. There's 16 chapters. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote 14 volumes. <laughs> and um, I got to get through them all. So there you go. Chapter 3. Still in chapter 3. We have to put this thing to rest this morning. I'm going to read verses 9 through 22 this morning. My, marks will be, my remarks, rather, will be based on that text. And so Paul writes to the church at Rome, What then? Are we better than they? Speaking of the Jews, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Our Father, we ask that you would add your presence and your blessing to the reading and proclamation of this, your holy word, we pray again in Jesus' name. Amen. So is anyone righteous? No, not one. He repeated it. He's driving that home. He's doubling down on that no, not one thing. And here you are thinking you were the one. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks. That means all of Russ's relatives. His mother's Jewish, his father's Greek. I always think of Russ when that comes up. I can't help it. All of Russ's relatives are under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not one pretentious. No, kidding aside, there's none righteous, no, not one. I didn't know we had a bell tower. I'm the builder, I didn't put a bell tower in. So the apostle doubles down here on the doctrine we call total depravity. We like to name our doctrines. Excuse me. I always, make, I always make fun of people that drink water, but today I need it. Um, so total depravity, that's the doctrine of the spiritual condition of people since the fall. What he's doing is he's, he's giving us the facts of the human condition. And we've all fallen into sin. And there's no one absolved of it in and of himself. And we spent the last few weeks laboring over this point with the Apostle Paul, who wants to make sure that we all know that we cannot help ourselves out of this commitment. We're in it alone, together, but alone. We can't help each other, and we can't help ourselves. And so we have to face this truth about our race, about our essential goodness or badness. Friends, in evangelism, and it seems this is a very evangelistic sermon, if you think about it, right? He has to convince the reader that he's a sinner. He's not absolved. 
He can't judge himself as righteous and other men as unrighteous. He can't do that. We're all under sin. And so the evangelist makes this point. And friends, you have to make this point in evangelism. It has to come out. You can't be saved if you're not saved from sin. That's what we're saved from. We're saved out of sin and we're saved into something. And by the way, that something is the church. So get a church. Because that's what we're saved into. And so we must face this truth about ourselves. The evangelist has to proclaim this. But you, here's the thing. You don't have to convince somebody of this, but you do have to proclaim it. You know, God can do the convincing inwardly. Think about this. The farmer plants the seed, Paul wrote elsewhere, but God gives growth. But plant the right seeds. And the right seeds, people have to know they have a need for Christ before they truly come to Christ. You see. Otherwise, it's sort of this little religious exercise, this little academic theological point. But it can't be that. It has to be the inward man crying out for salvation because he knows he's a sinner. He's not the one exception. Now, as far as the Jews are concerned, he, he knows that their boast is that they possess the oracles of God. We've talked about this. We've talked about this for a couple of weeks. The oracles, the written word of God. And so Paul uses the word as exhibit A against them. The fact that they possess the word of God, they use to their glory. Paul uses it as evidence against them, to convict them. What does he say here? We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And every, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... No flesh will be justified. So it's wonderful that you have the law. The, the point is, have you kept the law? And we know that no one's kept the law. He tells us continually that no one's kept the law. Jesus told us continually, no one keeps the law. And so they had the oracles, and so Paul uses that as exhibit A against them. He could speak from his own personal revelation, but instead he summons the sages of ages past. He calls up the sentiments of prophets and wise men who preceded them. He turns Jewish attention to the heart of their very own religious convictions. You want to boast about the oracles? It's them that condemn you. And so the first charge is from David, the prophet king of Israel, that every Jew would have recognized as the epitome of righteousness, God-ordained as psalmist, prophet, and king. And so the apostle reminds them of his words from Psalm 14, where we read, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All of these are quotations. Paul's not making them up. The doctrine isn't new. He's just reminding the Jews, I think you've missed this in your reading. There is no God, David wrote. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. And then he says this, there is none who does good. Paul is quoting from a prophet a thousand years before him. Their own religious beliefs that they boast of will convict them. Now, if we're careful in our examination of the order of Paul's diatribe, if you will, against the popular notion of the essential goodness of all men, we'll see that there is a logical order to his statements. The first section of the text is a biblical reference to the general condition of man as he exists in the spiritual realm. Friends, man is literally, spiritually dead. And I'm going to hammer that point home this morning. And so Paul's able to say with confidence that we are all under sin. We're not born with life in us. And get over this notion that we're born innocent. We're not. We're born guilty. And I'd say, I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you, but I'm happy to be the one to have to tell you. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, right? Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones says it's the glory of a preacher to be repetitive. The boys think I'm repetitive because I'm an old guy, but really, it's preachers in general, young and old. In fact, people say sometimes, you know, Pastor Danny, he preaches over my head. And she said, don't worry, he'll repeat it. <laughs> Karen says that all the time, don't worry, he'll say it again. Just keep coming. 
just keep coming and eventually you'll get there and, you, and, and then you'll turn to someone next to you and say, I know what he means. <laughs> but repetition works best when we vary its expression. We don't just say the same thing over and over. That makes it a cliche and you know I hate cliches. And so he gives us this thunderbolt of reality that we, the Jews and Greeks, all of us, are under sin. We are sinful beings. Sin is enmity against God. And there's none righteous, he says. And so he quotes the psalmist, David, there's none righteous. And then he exegetes the charge by emphasizing the specific extent of it. It could have been enough to simply say there's none righteous, but he takes a cue from the word none and he says, no, not one. He's doing that thing people do when they're trying to emphasis nothing and they say, nothing, zero, nada. Have you ever heard anyone do that? That's what he's doing here. There's none righteous. No, not one. Again, Lloyd-Jones always said that a preacher does not need to know his audience in order to make some very explicit claims about them in the spiritual realm. And I'm chuckling because I heard him preach one time on an old cassette tape. I guess you can go online now and hear him whenever you want, but in the old days you had to have a little mechanical thing that you shoved in there. And he got up and he talked like this. And he said, I don't know any of you today who sit here before me. But I know one thing for certain about every one of you, and that's that you're all miserable sinners. And he was right. Right? Somebody has to dare to do that again. Wake us up, O oh Lord. And that's what the book of Romans does for several chapters. And so I thought I'd demonstrate what ought to be an obvious conclusion with regard to the spiritual nature of man. And we'll get to that, but first, we should peruse the counsel of God on the subject, and we'll find that the whole scripture attests to this very fact that Paul elaborates here. We're not basing conclusions upon one small little text of scripture hidden away in the dark recesses of a long and tedious collection of books. We don't do doctrine that way. The evil that defines the race of man is documented throughout the word of God and it will serve us all well to consider it. From beginning to end, we'll find this doctrine. Isaiah said it this way. Isaiah lived between David and Paul about 700 years before Christ in the kingdom of Hezekiah. He was Hezekiah's right-hand man and prophet in the palace. And Isaiah said, we're all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Friends, this is a Jew speaking to his fellow Jews on the nature of all men. And then the prophet elaborates. He said, we all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Iniquities are sins. And there's no one, again, there's this no one thing going on here. There's no one who calls upon your name. Friends, so many people call upon the name of the Lord and he does not hear them because they're not calling from their hearts. They're calling as some little traditional academic exercise. They don't call upon your name, he says. What did Paul say? There's none who seeks after God. You might say, I know a lot of people that seek God, do they? Or are they, th or are they seeking some theoretical academic hope that maybe God exists? Is it just a, is it just a, um, for a book report or something that you're seeking God? There's no one who calls upon your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you've hidden your face from us and you've consumed us because of our iniquities. And then he said what Pastor Ken used to say all the time, all we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53, 6. And the apostle wrote of the perceived righteousness of men, particularly the Jews. This is why Paul understands this. You see, Paul is a Jew. Paul's a Pharisee, right? And so he wrote this to the Philippians about this sort of perceived righteousness that we tend to have. Well, look at me. Look at all the good things that I do. Look at all the achievements I've achieved. Look at my degrees. Look at my resume. 
And so Paul says, if anyone thinks he may, he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted a loss for Christ. It means nothing without Christ. And it will perish with him without Christ. And so he writes, yes indeed, I also count out all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Friends, all human effort and achievement is worthless in the spiritual realm and impotent to deliver a sinful soul into a sinless eternity with God. All these things represent the glory of man. The great civilizations, Rome's great civilization, so was ancient Babylon, so was Persia. At a million man army centuries before Christ, great glorious kings in great glorious palaces and edifices. And how do we find the glory of man today? We dig in the sand and gently brush away the deterioration of man's glory. Everything fades, but the glory of God goes on. Everything we do is worthless in the spiritual realm and impotent to deliver a sinful soul into a sinless eternity with God. All of your accomplishments, great men, cannot deliver you to God in the end. And when we come near the end, what God does with us, it's so miraculous. He puts us in that place where there's really only one question. And it's the question we distracted ourselves from and avoided all our lives long. There's one question. What happens now? Who's here to save me now? I remember a scene from the movie Gladiator. Where's Jonathan? You out there? Maximus, great general in the Roman army, spoke to Marcus Aurelius of his view of the world. And he said, I've seen much of the rest of the world. It is brutal, cruel, and dark. And Rome is the light. Well, the Christians are almost like that. We've seen much of the rest of the world, including Rome. It's brutal, cruel, and dark. And Christ is the light. This is the only acceptable process of sanctification by a man of God, friends, to examine his own sense of personal righteousness and see that so far as you can count yourself righteous and separate yourself, you separate yourself from the righteousness of God. If you examine your life and find yourself righteous, you are disqualified to come before Christ. All that you have done or may do outside the context of the new birth, friends, is, as the prophet says, dung. We have another word, don't we? It means the same thing. You've, your perceived righteousness, friends, as long as you cling to it, is a wall that will bar you from entry into the righteousness that is from Christ. In other words, when you come to Christ and he receives you, and when he blesses you with new life, you have to walk away knowing that you were blessed, but you didn't deserve it. You didn't bring yourself there. And that's what Paul's telling us here. That's what every evangelist has to establish when he's speaking to the unbeliever. So as long as you hold on to your sense of personal righteousness, you make yourself unavailable for real righteousness. It's only when we come to see our gain is lost that we're ready to accept genuine righteousness. I count it as rubbish that I might gain Christ. thought I would get a little personal about this. My early days of conversion. I was right around 30 years old. I was a young man. I was one of those men who was on a very destructive road, did all the bad things, all the bad habits. I won't enumerate them for you this morning. 
And how do the Irish say it? May the road rise up to meet you. The, rose ride up, the, the road rose up and smote me. I remember the Lord saying to me, all that you are must be forsaken. Forsake all that you are, all that you believe, all that you thought was good and right about the world, about yourself. Your habits have to go. Your language has to be reformed. Your revelries have to be avoided. Your associates have to be forsaken. All your current beliefs and convictions about the nature of things must be left behind. Your beliefs about God, your beliefs about man, the lust of your eyes, your pride of life must all die an immediate death in you. Your belief in yourself must go. That's the most hated cliche of all. Oh, just trust your own heart. Your heart is a not good custodian of your soul. Believe me with that. Your belief in yourself must go, he said, for I will have no strange gods before me. You either trust in me or you trust in yourself. I had always heard the cliche, follow your heart. But I knew something that some people didn't know. My heart got me right where I was. I followed it right down to the pit. And that's where it took me. And maybe you're following it down to the pit, but your pit might be decorated. Mine wasn't. Right? Your pit might be a corner office with leather couches. You know, in the bar over there with the spritzer. <laughs> I heard that a person should trust in himself. And then I read the Proverbs. And the Proverbs said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. It's another way of saying, don't trust in your heart. There's nothing good there. Jeremiah said the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And so I did as the Lord directed me. And I really did. And I remember the day and I remember the moment. I left my habits, my loves, my worldly joys went with them. My friends and associates, who all my adult life I had kept company with, I turned away from. Some asked why, and when I told them, they were content to let me go. My lust, my pride, belief in self, all gone. I closed my eyes. I gave them all to God. I confessed to Christ in prayer that I was fearful and alone and had nothing left. I'd given it all away. No sense of my former self to cling to. No drink, no drug, no happy song. I heard no word from him. I opened my eyes and found myself the possessor of all things. I thought I'd given it away. Subtraction is addition in the kingdom of God. I possessed the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was more than enough. And I knew it. In a moment, I had his word, and his word said to me, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Don't worry about them, it said. That's the next verse. Don't worry about it. The trouble for the day is sufficient. If anyone finds reason to object to the strong language of the apostle of the condition of natural man, consider the statement of Jesus who said to the Pharisees, who were famous, by the way, for justifying themselves, Jesus said, you are those who justify yourselves before man, but God knows your heart. You know, it, it's really not difficult to hide your true heart from other men, is it? You know? Friends, we were wearing masks long before Dr. Fauci told us to wear masks. Right? For what's highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God, Jesus said. I literally said to God what the psalmist said. I said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
And there's only one way to go. And I looked back, you know, the road was barred. There was no way back. <laughs> I had to go on. Verses 11 and 12, there is none who understands. Don't expect the man on the street will understand the simple wisdom of God. That's not, I'm not saying don't give it to him. I'm just saying don't expect him to understand it. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks. There's none who seeks, friend. Seeking is not a mere questioning of his existence. in some sort of dry, theoretical, academic way, writing a paper on it for school, the existence of God, as so many have done. I went to school, I went to college, Karen and I studied the Old Testament and the New Testament from professors who had not one bit of faith in anything that was written there. Didn't believe it at all. I'll tell you a story. I remember one time, we're doing our Old Testament class, and this woman was teaching. We had a woman professor for this one. Can't think of her name right now. And we were talking about, we were in Genesis, and we were talking about the, the ark and the two by two. And the flood came and washed it all away. And she was talking about it as an archetypal myth that's, you know, people dream up and there's various ways they come to these conclusions and people all over the world have similar myths that they go by and this is, happens to be the Hebrew myth. You know the story. Well, if you came to Bible study, you'd know about this. And... Uh, and I'm sitting there, and at the time, of course, I'm as pagan as anyone else in the room, and I was okay with it. Of course, that didn't happen. And then one girl in the back of the room, this was a Catholic college, she raised her hand, she called on her, and the girl stood up and said, you mean it's not true? Whew. And my heart sunk for this poor, stupid person who thought the word of God was true. That was my true feeling. That poor girl was deceived. And the truth of it is, all the rest of us were deceived. She knew it was true. She read it and somehow it registered, this is God's word. This is the history of our world. And the rest of us, no, this is a little tradition of the ancients. They come up with these things about floods and gods and all of these ridiculous things. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've together become unprofitable. You know. I looked up the root word of unprofitable. You know what it means? It means sour milk. It's good for nothing. You go and you open the fridge in the morning. You're going to have your morning cereal or your morning coffee. And you take it out and it's curdled and soured. And you look at the date and it's last year. And you go, <laughs> it, really, it really can be because we don't drink milk in our house. We don't drink water and we don't drink milk. And all of that you do, all, the, all you that do that are doing something wrong. Just kidding. Um, yeah, they become unprofitable. Sour milk, good for nothing. Can't flavor the coffee uh, or the Captain Crunch. There's none who does good, no, not one. Paul again returns to the Psalms and again he begins with the essential act of human folly. To what? To kill God in our thoughts. There is no God. Friends, I've said it. Let me say it again. Atheism is the beginning of insanity. You can't be right in the mind and deny God a whole life long and think you're going to be okay. Intellectually, I'm talking about. You're going to lose something in the translation. That fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He's killed God in his thoughts. They are corrupt, Paul says, and have done abominable iniquity. There's none who does good. And from Ecclesiastes, he references, for there's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So you see, he's repeating what the Jews already should have known. And he knows they didn't. They missed it about them. They thought just having their Bible, if you will, which was the Old Testament, right? Just having access to it, they thought was their access to God. And he said, no. It was an advantage, he admitted. But for most of us, it wasn't advantage enough. 
So what I began to demonstrate earlier, let's look at now. We may remember the innocent nature of our original parents, as it should be, right? Didn't last long. I always wish Moses wrote a little bit more about the garden. You know, how many thousands of years happened? Come on, give us a hint. The couple was in the garden experiencing life as it was intended to be, lived out in the presence of God. How? In earthly abundance? Imagine food just was everywhere, all over the trees. There weren't any, there might have been insects, but they weren't the kind that eat the food, that much I can tell you. That's part of the curse, right? Earthly abundance, divine protection, nothing could hurt them or come near them. Exuberant health. An expectation of life everlasting never dawned on them that anything could go bad or go different. They were in the garden. And then sin entered. It entered, but it was, it was invited in. It was partaken of. And we all know the story, so I won't deal with all the particulars right now, but we should focus on one thing as first and foremost. The abundance was gone, that's true. The protection was diminished. Physical health put in jeopardy. Shame became the new companion of the first couple. And the dreadful specter of hell and death and separation from God entered the now fearful hearts of men. It entered then, it never departed. We all have to think about it. Half the prayers this morning were about our physical health. We're so fragile. I know all about it. Had a lot of work done. You know, the Botox and the smiles and all that. Had all that done. Um, And the Lord God said, and he said a thing, and then he followed through. And so we read, God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it you shall surely die. Just thought I'd reiterate the warning. I know we've all heard it. First consideration here in the famous warning is to remember that the Lord God does not bluff. This is not a bluff. There are no empty threats. There's no lack of power to fulfill a threat once he makes it. And so we have the promise of what will happen. In that day you'll surely die. and, And I would ask you to remember that the biblical concept of death is always connected first with the spiritual separation from God. And we saw it immediately. They hid themselves in the garden. They heard the footsteps of the Lord in the cool of the day. And he convicted them. Why are you hiding? And who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I said do not eat? And it was gone. You ever do something wrong and in that moment you think, if I could only go back one second, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't have said that. You can't do anything about it. You know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. The feathers are out of the pillow. How many other senseless illustrations can I come up with? But it's out there, and you can't get it back. And so the sin of the first couple killed them on the spot. You say, but pastor, they lived hundreds of years. No, they died the minute they disobeyed God. Death came in them. Spiritual death, separated from God, and they knew they were dead. They went in the, in the bush to hide when God appeared at the prayer time in the cool of the day. So their spirits died within them. You know, we talk about spirits and bodies and all those things. It, it might be helpful to just, for me just to say this, and this is separate from what I'm preaching on today, but think of it this way. You are a spirit. I want you to know that's what you are. That's the essence of your being. The nephesh, the pneuma in the Greek, right? That's what you are. You're a spirit. It means wind (laughs) in those languages, but it also means spirit. You are a spirit. Remember that. You have a soul, and you live in a body, but you are a spirit. And their closeness to God came to an end after that act. God is not the God of the dead. But the dead have their God. And the Lord of all creation, Adam, 
Adam was the Lord of all creation, small l, but he was the Lord in the garden. Take dominion. That's what kings do. Kings take dominion. So the Lord of all creation, the federal head whose order was to take dominion, failed in the task and bowed to the other God, who was no God at all, but he's a formidable spiritual being. There's really only one God, so all of our idols, remember, are not gods. So God just gets offended that we treat them like they are. You obeyed him, he must be your God. The one you obey is God to you. You may remember Satan's words to the second Adam. Do you know this reference, the second Adam? It's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talks about Jesus as the second Adam. You know, when Satan came and tempted Jesus, he, he looked at the part of him that he looked at in Adam. This is a man. I can trick this guy. I've been here before. Been here, done that. Right? Maybe I do like cliches. You may, you may remember Satan's words to the second Adam. And we read again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Remember that? Luke said it a little differently. Listen to the emphasis here. The devil said to Jesus, or rather we read, then the devil taking him upon a high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He must have the projector up there. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Some kind of trance they went into together. Jesus and Satan on a high mountain. Later on, he'll take them to the pinnacle of the temple. Right? Right? I haven't done the calculations recently, but I remember the temple was something like 18 modern stories high. Throw yourself down, for it is written, angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone, remember? This was the second Adam. This Adam couldn't be fooled. And the devil said to him, all this authority I give to you in their glory. Listen to this, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I will. He's the new Lord, and he knew it. The old Lord handed the baton to the new Lord, who Paul himself calls the God of this world. And Satan likes the term. He's the God of this world. It was given to me, and I'll give it to whomever I wish. And so there it is. Adam could have ordered the, honored rather the command of God. Instead, he bowed to another being. He changed, exchanged one God for the other. He took the bait that Jesus didn't take. And in the exchange, he left the Lord of the living for the Lord of the dead. And so this whole world of dead spirits, Paul wrote in Romans 1, worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. It's the natural order. Paganism is the natural order of the human race. So it wasn't the apple, friends. It was the act of disobedience that did it. It was the act that was the poison. This was the devil's first triumph. Adam, the son of God, Luke 3.38. If you don't like that reference, go there. Adam is the son of God, he's called. Adam, the son of God, bowed to the devil. Adam was Lord of all creation. He was the ordained head to take dominion of the earth. Eve ate. Now this I theorize, all right? Eve ate of the apple, but that could have been remedied by the Lord if he wanted to, by Adam if he wanted to, right? Could have been remedied. He could have, uh, it could have, been punished. The act could have been punished by Adam. But his fall to the temptation was the literal exchange of one regime for the other. And if you go back and you're careful in your study of this, you'll see that God warned Adam about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before he even created Eve. It was up to Adam to teach his wife. Remember that, gentlemen. It's important. Maybe he taught her. Maybe he didn't. It seems he did because she did give the serpent the line, right? 
But this is where the believer must be especially careful because we're daily attempted, or tempted rather, with similar choices. Believers have to be on guard of this. Moses said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him, for he's your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you. Choose rightly, friends. Daily we're confronted with choices, crossroads. Remember Robert Frost? Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. Right? And he had to choose one or the other. That's our daily walk. Joshua, too, spoke about this choosing thing. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You know, I always picture that. He just had come to a great triumph, right? Came to a great triumph. It's near the end of the book of Joshua. Joshua's nearing the end of his days. And it reminds me of those times in American history. You might see it in movies where they, they're looking, the, the, the army's looking for volunteers. And the volunteers come in. He said, now... And they move forward, and they're going toward getting to do the impossible task. And finally, the general or the captain comes out and says, Look, if any of you have lost heart in the mission and you want to leave, leave now, and we we'll, won't think anything bad about you. I give you another chance to leave. It seems to me that's what Joshua is doing here. If you want to leave, if you don't want to trust the God that took us all this way, then go now. Better that you go and just believe on the gods of the other side of the river, he said, right? Or the Amorites in whose land you dwell, Right? It seems to me that's what he's doing. If you want to leave, leave now. But if you're either with me, and I'm going to hold you to it once you're with me. You've made your decision. Choose this day who you will serve. Friends, the natural man, see, that's for the Christian, though. The natural man has no choice in the matter. He has no capability to do right in the eyes of God. And so Paul wrote of it elsewhere. He said, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Dead spirits are poor discerners of truth. They're spiritually discerned. The natural man, what's that mean? That's all of us at one point in our lives, with all men and women born of Adam, are natural men. We cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, but we don't want to because they're foolishness to us. And the gospel establishes that first. That's who you are in Adam. And your whole predicament is how do you get out of this predicament? What's the way out? Verses 13 through 17. Their throat is an open tomb. That with their tongues they utter, they practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of bitterness and cursing. Their sweet feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. And so Paul turns from the doctrine of depravity to the manifestation of depravity. Friends, if depraved men do depraved things, but they first believe depraved things. And so again, he quotes, these are all quotations from Psalms 5, verse 9, and 140, verse 3, and then again from Isaiah 59, 7, and 8. There's no new doctrine here. And Paul's exposition of Scripture is thorough, and it's probing, and so he moves from the fact to the act, from the, from the philosophy of depravity to the manifestation of depravity. And so we read that the throat is an open tomb. What an illustration. The throat. Well, what's in the throat? The voice is in the throat. Words are in the throat. These things are important to God. How much scriptural ink has been spent on the power of the tongue? Go to the book of James. The throat, the voice, the words of men are death. Their throat is an open tomb. 
And he doesn't say a closed tomb. He means open so that all the stench of it comes out. Like when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus and Martha and Mary came out. Jesus said, roll away the stone. They said, but he's been there four days. There's bound to be a stench. And the Jews hate stench. Jews don't like dead things. If you're near a dead thing, you're disqualified from solemn festivals for the next few days. Can't come near. Got to wait. Got to quarantine. Social distance. They're an open tomb, friends. Dead, decaying bodies are anathema to the Jews. And he's saying, but that's you. That's your throat. That's your words. What are, what are words? They're thoughts with clothes on or something. They're they came out of somewhere, out of your soul. We may remember that Samson, before his downward spiral, away from his Nazarite vows, remember never to cut his hair, never to touch a dead thing, never to, uh, um, what, was it, what was the third one? Never drink wine. Never drink wine or strong drink. Even his mother couldn't drink it in pregnancy. Of course, nobody can now, but in the old days they did. So he had to tell Samson's mother, don't drink wine. And he started, the first thing, what did he do? He was so hungry that he saw this lion that he had killed, and there was a beehive in the lion, and there was honey, and he went in and he ate the honey out of the dead carcass of the lion. Touched a dead thing. Broke the first vow. Now, Jews don't like dead things. Paul speaks about our words as poison. The asp is one of the more subtle and dangerous species of snake. You know, it's a very strange snake. They have a, right in the front, they have a poisonous sack. It's deadly, more deadly than most snakes. And they have these fangs that go horizontal. And when they go to bite, you would look and you wouldn't see the fang, and all of a sudden, (laughs) they come out. One of them pierces the sack, and you're immediately poisoned unto death. The poison of asps is under your lips. He's talking about words here. Words are the fruits of belief. You might say belief is the seed and the word is the fruit. You know, work with me. I'm I'm going here. Um, The asp is one of the more subtle snakes. Its fangs come out at the point of contact. They're respectable and unseen until the strike. And then they pierce the poison sack in the front of the mouth and death is imminent. And he's saying that's what your lips are like. That's a... Wicked insult, right? Note the scriptural emphasis on words, the tongue, the throat, the deceit, all like fangs to pierce the mind and inject the poison. Destruction and misery are in their ways, he writes. We're certainly the architects of our own miseries, friends. And I'm amazed at how readily even Christian people believe what they want to believe rather than what's clearly revealed. So many times, I just read a verse and tell someone, this is what it says, and they say, well, I believe this. I'm like, we're supposed to believe what this says. We're supposed to get rid of what we formerly thought. Paul wrote of this very thing to Timothy. He said, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Friends, what are deceiving spirits? You may not know this, but deceiving spirits are other people. That's what he's talking about. And there's doctrines of demons. The doctrines are of the demons. The people are the spirits that deceive one another because their lips are like the poison of asps, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so a man is deceitful, and the demonic world is ever anxious to help him along in this. Propaganda, friends. That's all we get today. It's very hard to know the truth about something that you're not researching yourself. You know, these represent manifestations of human evil. Paul says that the mouth of man is full of bitterness and cursing. What did Paul start out saying? The wrath of man is on, the wrath of God is on man because he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Men are violent, bloody, destructive things, destructive beings. And so peace has eluded our world. And that could hardly be more demonstrative than in Eastern Europe of the present moment in history. We can argue about our part in the war, if we should intervene to prevent killing. The principals, the presidents involved may argue about ownership of territories, but everyone will agree that the killing is rampant and senseless. 
and arbitrary. Shoot anything that moves. It's so demonstrative of what he's saying here. Destruction and misery are in their path. But the believer must know that what we're seeing is the depravity of human hearts and the willful, deadly manifestation of human remedies for our insults and our offenses. You know, someone gets offended today and a country has to go be wiped off the map. You know, this is a little political aside, but have you heard the story that I think you know that President Zelensky was an actor? Did you know that? He was in a very, uh, he was a comedian. He was a comic actor, and he was in a series on television in Ukraine where he played the president of Ukraine. And do you know he did a whole spoof of Vladimir Putin, and some people are theorizing that that's what this is all about? I mean, that's evil in men. Everything today is capital punishment. Someone says something offensive, you want them dead! God punished Israel of old for um, punishing an iniquity too violently. You may not remember that. They violated the sister of the 12 brothers named Dinah. One man violated them, they wiped out the whole tribe. You might remember. That's how men are. So we have the doctrine, we have the manifestation of the doctrine, and so the apostle's not remiss to give us the reason for the doctrine. And so this is, this is what we have, this is what we believe, this is what we do, and verse 18, this is why we do it. There's no fear of God before their eyes. That's the reason that men do this, these things. They really don't believe that God's watching over them, a righteous God, judging their every act. And so there's this reason for our predicament. From the beginning, men had no proper fear of God. And the fear of God is to what? It's to acknowledge Him. But you can't acknowledge Him if you haven't come into contact with Him in some way. And we've already seen the futility of that hope. The natural man has no intellectual access to the things of God. So how does he get saved? So we have our doctrine, natural men are those born of Adam, they're recipients of the first birth, we're all partakers of that very thing with them. Friends, Adam died in the garden in our primeval past, and we're all sons and daughters of him. And so all men are stillborn in the spiritual sense. We're all born spiritually dead. How does a dead father give life to a living son? Can't happen. We're all born in trespasses and sin, and if we're careful to understand our doctrine, we can see that in the, in the natural dead state of all people, there's no hope of ever moving past the spiritual death we inherited from our first parents. This is what this evangelist is establishing. No hope. He wants us to give up on ourselves. He wants us to give up on our feudal human traditions and religions, for that matter. So what's the lesson then? What's the extent of our depravity? If all men are fallen so deceitful, so poisonous and destructive that one man cannot bestow salvation on another, then how can anyone be saved? If I can't give it to you and you can't give it to me and we can't reason out a way between us because we haven't got the equipment, it's a pretty desperate place to be. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Right? That's the religion of men that see that. Jesus himself said that. So what's the apostle doing? He's starving us. He's bringing us parched and salivating to the cross of Christ. We're crawling there. We've got nothing. We know we can't depend on all these things. He's broken them down. He's argued them away. He's beaten us at our own game. And so he offers these wonderful words. But now... But now, he writes, but now something has changed in the cosmos. But now there's a path that hadn't been paved before that's paved. But now there is, in this hopeless reality, a way of escape. There's a rescue taking place. And so the teaching thus far 
is true thus far, but now it's changed. There's a rescuer. We can't rescue ourselves, but there is a rescuer. We can't save ourselves, but there is a savior. And we're parched. And we're striving for some truth, for some drink to bring life back into our bodies because we believe him that there's nothing in us that can save ourselves. But now the righteousness of God is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, they hinted about it. Even the righteousness of God, which is not through acts of righteousness, which we have done, but he says through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. And so he clears away the clutter of human sin and helplessness and hopelessness. And there's one thing standing there, an implement of torture with a bloodied and tortured man on it. And there's your hope, he says. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. But now, someone took my penalty for me. Imagine after all this preaching, the man's down on the ground, desperately writhing in his own sin. And he looks up and he says, but someone else took the penalty. What a miracle. I don't have to pay it. Yes, I did all the things. We all know that. It's on my resume. Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day, did me no good. And they look as a man dead on a cross, bloodied and dying and dead. That was my sin that was punished there. But now there is a new gospel an acceptable sacrifice, a righteous deliverer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Can it be that simple? It has to be. There's nothing else left. You were talked out of your righteousness. Paul wrote of this very thing later on in the epistle, and I'll close with this. But next week, the name of the sermon is, But now, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he writes, nothing good dwells. You know, Pastor Ken used to tell a story. He had, Steve, you'll remember this in Ross, he, he had the mink farm. Remember the mink farm? Ken made a lot of money in minks. He was a mink farmer. You sell minks for coats, they're very expensive coats, right? And you know how commodities go up and down. <laughs> it crashed. It crashed. No fault of his own. The market crashed. He went from rich to poor in a moment of time. And he told me he was walking. The mink farm was over past my house over there. There was another farm there. And Ken tells the story. He's walking through the woods. He had to preach that night, right? And he's walking through the woods, and he said, this is his story, not mine. Ken said, well, what am I going to tell him, Lord? And he said, the Lord said to me, I guess you're not going to tell him about you. <laughs> You're going to tell them about me, in other words, right? Paul wrote this very thing, For I know that in me, that in my flesh, nothing good dwells. By the way, if that was Ken's Job moment, he did get rich again. I can tell you that. <laughs> for the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I do. And he can only come to one conclusion. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hey, stay tuned. Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you for the Savior. We praise you for this lesson of the true nature of ourselves and the true grace. For it's not grace if we earn it, O oh Lord, it's grace because it was such a gracious gift of a gracious God. We praise you for your Son. May we be resurrected with him by faith in him, O oh Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.